this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're learning about the science and application of coral restoration. We start off talking with Division of Aquatic Resources Administrator, Brian Nielsen. We're at the Nui Nui Fisheries Research Center. Traditionally, this was an area that focused on fisheries aquaculture, research development, been transformed into this whole restoration facilities. We grow corals here, we grow sea urchins to combat invasive seaweed, so it it's kind of has a new life right now. DAR's mission is to manage, protect, and restore aquatic resources for future and current generations. So we're not only tasked with trying to manage all of our fish and aquatic resources throughout the state for current current generations, but we also tasked with trying to make sure that our plans incorporate protection and sustainability for the next generation. This is a facility that, that brings hope, and it gives me hope that there is a future with coral in it. If the coral nursery and the outplanning restoration projects are successful, what would that look like in 10 to 20 years? We're absolutely trying to see if we can scale this up to the square mile level that, that's needed to really make a difference. And then also looking at some of these other impacts to the reef um, that are controllable, like runoff or um, sustainable fishing practices, invasive species, really getting a handle on some of these issues we've been trying to, to battle for decades. So you look at a huge wildfire that, that burns down a forest. Those those foresters have centuries of reforestation techniques to lean on when they're trying to restore that forest. Where we're really at the early stages of coral restoration, all of that technology is right now just being innovated and we need all the help we can get. Larger scale, more facilities, more partners, that's the direction that, that we're heading. This is an unusual collaboration between an academic institution, the University of Hawaii, and a state agency, the Division of Aquatic Resources. The overall question we're interested in is how can we grow corals more quickly and more efficiently for use in restoration projects. In my lab, we're also really interested in some of the basic biology of the organisms themselves, uh, particularly uh, corals that seem to be able to live across a wide range of uh, habitats with respect to light, temperature, sedimentation, and what types of corals might become more important in the future as environments continue to change in response to global climate change. Here at the nursery facility, we're growing corals under different conditions, and that's where the expertise of the staff here comes in to vary things like light, water flow, food regimes. And then back in my lab, we do primarily genetic analysis of those individuals involved in those experiments. One of the projects in the lab involves looking for genes and certain variants of genes that seem to be associated with corals that have an ability to withstand the conditions that normally cause bleaching. Most of the projects revolve around using genetic tools to understand variation in nature. One of the tools we're using is this technique called the analysis of environmental DNA. Environmental DNA is DNA that is shed by living organisms into the sea. DNA can persist long enough in the water that scientists like I can come along and sample that water, filter out the DNA, and analyze that DNA for an understanding of what organisms are living in the water. So with this environmental DNA, you're actually scooping some water and you can tell what corals are living nearby without ever having to take a piece of that coral itself. Absolutely, yeah. So from a two liter sample of water, we can characterize the reef with respect to what corals are there over an area probably about the size of a football field. And it's quite accurate when we compare it to visual surveys. And so uh, it's a very powerful tool to quickly and cheaply assess a coral reef. And it can be applied to any other types of organisms living on reefs, like coral reef fish or all of the invertebrate species that live on reefs, particularly those that you can't see when you swim over a reef. And so this is a really useful tool for documenting what we call cryptic diversity, the diversity of, of primarily invertebrate organisms that live inside the reef and that depend on the reef structure itself for their homes.
University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant. As you might have heard, coral restoration is like the big new thing. It's the soup of the day. We're seeing coral nurseries all over the place, throughout the Caribbean, Southeast Asia, Australia, Indian Ocean starting to put some in. And in Hawaii, we're starting to get a lot of interest in developing coral nurseries. We break the coral nursery up into two functional units. There is the fast growth production units, which is the room, one of the rooms that we're in right now. And then we have our coral arc. The function of the coral arc is to maintain the coral biodiversity of Hawaii. So we have coral species from all over the archipelago that we maintain in there under very strong biosecurity situations. If I go to Florida, the average coral grows at about 15 to 20 centimeters a year. Well, that's pretty quick. That, and it is. And, and in Australia, 20 centimeters a year. Um, parts of the South Pacific and Southeast Asia, you might hit 25 centimeters a year. In Hawaii, the average coral species grows one to two centimeters a year. That means if I have the same coral that's damaged in Florida and the same size coral damaged in here, the one in Florida may recover in five to 10 years. Here it might take 50 to 100 years. We developed this idea, it's basically using a technique that others have used, home aquarist industry has used it for decades, called microfragmentation, where they break off little pieces of coral and those, that makes it grow faster. And a couple facilities in Florida and elsewhere have actually taken microfragmentation and, and tried to use it to fast grow corals. But what we had to do, because our corals grow so slowly, is actually combine that with standard aquarium techniques and these modules that you see around us to completely be able to grow a coral in a fraction of the time it would take normally. This is a, a 42 centimeter module, okay? And the module is that sort of pyramid shape. It's that pyramid shape, and the, the pyramid's important. We designed the pyramid in order to deal with the wave action that we have here on most of our reefs in Hawaii. How does the pyramid shape help with the waves? It allows the wave to attenuate over the module without impacting the coral to a great extent, but the angles of the pyramid allow sediment turbidity that's in the water not to settle on the coral and impede it, but to slough off. We tested this out over a period of a couple years to come up with the right design. So it's a 42 centimeter pyramid. What we do is we collect about 10 centimeters, about this much coral from the wild. We microfrag it, meaning we break it into tiny little pieces that are genetically identical. We glue it on using surgical super glue. You can see how they're growing and fusing together. Mm -hmm. And in a period in these tanks of about five to six months, we go from 10 centimeters to 42 centimeters. Now in the wild in Hawaii, that would take 20 to 25 years on average. We're doing it in about six months. And if you add on top of that, the time for collection, the time for mandatory quarantine, we can't just go from these tanks directly out in the wild. We have acclimation tanks where we kind of create crappy conditions that we find in the wild to simulate it and slowly get them used to it. Think of this tank like a five-star hotel in Waikiki. They get room service, they get maid service, they're getting all their whims taken care of. It's a perfect growth environment. We feed them, we have our own food recipes we've developed that promote growth. We give them optimal light. These are very expensive specialized lights that we can program to give them the optimal light they need for growth and minimize light that, that will allow algae and other competitors to do well in the tanks. The water is exceptionally filtered in order to make it as clean as possible. In each room, we have two full-time aquarists that are taking care of these corals, making sure that they have everything they need to grow as fast as they possibly can. And we have to go from that out into our reef environments, which is kind of like becoming homeless out on the street. So we have to get them used to that. We, we spend about a month or two getting them slowly used to turbidity and light conditions and wave conditions they're gonna encounter on the reef. So in total, we're able to grow 10 centimeters of source material into a 42 centimeter colony in under a year and get it out onto the reef. And in the wild, that would take 20 to 25 years. That's pretty good, all right? Not good enough. Because we have corals that are hundreds, if not thousands of years old. So now what we're doing, and that's what you see behind it, we're going bigger. We're going to a meter, about this big. 
One of the really cool things about working here, and I think if you talk to any of the staff who work here, they'll tell you the same thing, is each thing is leading to new. Uh, we started off with tiny little modules thinking, because that's what everybody was doing. We realized that's not going to work. We went to bigger. We realized, oh, we can go bigger than that. Now we just got to figure out how to do it. We came up with the one meter. Now we're moving beyond one meter. Our next goal is going to be two, three, four meter corals. And that's going to require a whole new technology to accomplish, which we're working on. It's a small nursery, but we're doing a lot of cool stuff here. Now we need to go even bigger and start affecting entire reefs. And every coral, when it comes into the nursery, is given a unique identifier. So we have full chain of custody on, from the point of collection all the way through its time in the nursery, all the way out to its out planning. So we can track any coral. When we go out to collect a coral, the first thing we do is assess it in the field for health, invasive species, et cetera. If the decision is made to collect it, it's brought in and it's clean here before it's put into a quarantine tank. We have this whole series of tanks outside that's quarantined. So each row of tanks has their own UVC filter. All the water going out goes through a UVC so we kill anything live before it goes back out. Ah. So we're not putting at risk anything in the wild, even though we only bring in Hawaiian corals and they're clean completely before they go in here. Minimum 30 days in quarantine, where it's assessed daily for micro predators, AIS, disease, health, etc. If it makes it through quarantine, then it comes in here and it's micro -fried. If at any time while it's in quarantine, we find a micro predator, or we find a disease or AIS, quarantine restarts. The coral is clean and we restart that 30 day window. We're very confident that the corals that came in here into these systems were clean. Then the problem is keeping this area clean. We limit access in, the rooms are isolated, the water is completely filtered before it comes in. This is a, a single mushroom coral. You can see the single mouth. So this is basically one animal, whereas most corals are hundreds or thousands of animals to make up a colony. These guys are always just one animal. And the problem is, how do you microfrag a single animal? It's like cutting off your arm and growing a whole new you. It, it probably won't work. Well, we found a way that it does work. And that you can see, if I put it upside down, you can see a wedge. And at the very tip of that wedge is a portion where the mouth was. And because of that, you can grow a whole new coral out of it. So we can get a bunch of little individual animals out of a single animal. So this is some of our rare coral art. These are, these are the three forms of, they're not out right now because they haven't been fed, but three forms of tabastria, which is a flower cup coral. There's a black form, a pink form, and an orange form. These are corals nobody ever sees. These are way, way, way in the back of caves. This is Balanophila, three species of that. These are native cave corals. None of these have zooxanthellae. None of these have the symbiotic plants in them. These are deep water leptoceras. They were collected by the University submarine from about 160 feet or deeper that we're maintaining here. These have very tiny bits and they need more in the UV a range because there's very little oranges, yellows, etc. At those depths, they're no, it's all blues and purples and UV. So they need that in order to photosynthesize. Corals make their own food. They have these little tiny single cell plants inside them that photosynthesize, pump out sugar and oxygen. They have like a, a Snickers candy bar factory inside them pumping out candy bars for them all the time. The problem is, is that's all sugar. And you need more than sugar. You need amino acids, you need proteins. We recognize that one way to make corals grow faster and grow healthier is if we feed them. Through a series of testings, we came up with our own recipe. And basically what it involves is stuff like frozen brine shrimp, spirulina, frozen clams, frozen reef plankton. And then what we do is using mochi ice cream trays as a mold, we cast our own coral pucks, our own coral food, 
that can then be dissolved in a beaker of seawater and we can use that to feed all the corals. And we have a couple recipes. We have one general recipe and then one for the really slow growing corals. We feed the corals three times a week. The problem is it's all dead food. It's not swimming around. And so anything the coral doesn't eat gums up our filters. So in a, in a way to cut down that waste, but also to provide the corals a little exercise of capturing and eating their own foods, we also grow our own live foods. We have two types of phytoplankton that we grow for feeding the corals, and we have two types of zooplankton that we grow. And they get live food once a week, and they get the, the dead food twice a week. Those are the starter cultures, by the way. So we're not feeding directly off of those. We actually have a multiplier tank outside. This tank has only one species in it. This is that really rare coral. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. We're talking with coral researcher Claire Lewis at the Anuenue Coral Restoration Facility. In this experiment right now, we're looking at two different species of coral. One is Pavona duodeni, and that would be one of these guys here. And you can tell that it's Pavona because it has this really distinctive stars, and they're all interconnected. You see those little lines that are between each of the different uh, mouths. That's the kind of hallmark of this genus. And one is Parides lobata, which would be like this one here. You can see that it's just lots of circles and there's no lines. So even though when you look at these from far away, they look pretty similar, but up close, they look very, very different. Basically what we're trying to do is just understand what light conditions they prefer to grow in and also whether or not they like high water flow or low water flow. So we have two different light conditions. So this would be high light, which is the equivalent of what they're using in the fragrum at the moment. And then we've got two other ones that are in dark conditions, which is about half as much light as the fragrum. And then for each of those light conditions, we have one tank which has these little power, power heads in here, which is putting more water flow, and one set that doesn't have those. So we can see how light affects it and how water flow affects it. Why are you interested in this question of amount of light and amount of water flow and its effect on coral growth? So we're interested in light because it's kind of uh, one of the main abiotic factors that would affect coral growth because they obviously live in this tight symbiotic relationship with algae that are photosynthesizing, which requires light. So light would be an important driver in terms of affecting their growth. And at the moment, we're kind of working under the assumption that all these different coral species all like the same amount of light. And that's probably not true, right? It's more likely than not that some corals like more and some like less. And we have reason to think that particularly some of these corals might prefer darker light conditions because they're often found at deeper depths. And then as far as um, the water flow, for this Pavona species, Pavona duodeni, it's very patchy across the island. So sometimes you find loads of it and sometimes you find none. And often the places where you find lots of it is high flow conditions. So there's loads at Makapu, for example. You would find tons of Pavona out there, Pavona duodeni. And so that was our thinking behind the water flow is like maybe they like that high energy environment more so than other species like you would find in Kaneohe Bay, which is really still. And what are your studies showing? At the moment, kind of hard to say because it's still ongoing. It definitely seems like it's different for the different species and to some extent different for individual corals. To just maintain this experiment and make sure we kind of keep the corals healthy, I come and clean them with a toothbrush every week so you don't get sediment buildup that might affect their growth. I randomize the tanks, they stay in their pairs but their actual position within the uh, tank changes and I randomize the tiles within the tank. Some of them are closer to the power heads than others, and some of them are further away, and so I randomize their positions within there and keep that consistent just so that we don't have those tank effects on the big scale and broad scale too, to make sure we're being as rigorous as possible. <laughs> and we have this great yellow tang who maintains the tank as well when I'm not here. 
all the tanks actually there's either a sea urchin or a couple of sea urchin, maybe some snails, the mm -hmm. herbivorous fish. Can you explain what you mean by they're helping to clean the tank? We get a lot of algal growth basically and algae that we don't want and algae uh, often compete with the corals and take up space. We put the fish in to just try and keep some of that under control and try and do their best. I do my part with the toothbrush and then they kind of fill in the rest. And so a lot of it is just to keep that algal growth under control. These two pieces of coral are genetically identical. They're no way. Clones of one another. The only thing that's different here is that this one is growing in the darker light condition and this one is growing in the brighter light condition. So it seems like for this um, individual, it definitely prefers the darker environment. Whereas, quick change. This is the same species, so again, Parides lobata, but this is a different individual, and this time the one that's grown in the highlight environment is growing much more than the one in the dark environment. So here we're seeing those individual effects where individual corals prefer different environments. And we also, after the fact, did genetic analyses on those to see if they had different photosynthetic symbiont communities, and those are exactly the same too. So the difference is the coral as opposed to the algae. The rest of my thesis is really focused on Pavona as a genus. What originally interested me in that group of corals is that they are just everywhere. Generally, there's a pattern of uh, highest diversity in an area known as the Coral Triangle, which is Indonesia and the Philippines. And it has a bullseye pattern and gets less and less diverse as you move out from there. And that's really pervasive. Soft corals, hard corals, fish, pretty much everything follows that trend. Pavona don't. They're basically, all of them are everywhere all the time. And that's really weird and unlikely, essentially. So they're also a group which is really understudied and they haven't had their phylogenetics or taxonomy really properly looked at in a long time. And so my initial thought was like, there's probably lots of smaller ranged endemic species that are kind of conforming to that pattern. We just haven't looked at it closely enough. And in particular, the Pavona variants, because it's so variable, it's in the name, it's probably lots of cryptic species broken down in that. And it's probably lots of smaller ones. That first experiment we did with the Pavona variants in some other tanks here, we had four parent colonies to start with and we fragged them into these smaller pieces. I was pretty careful because I thought there was probably this cryptic species problem with that group. And so I thought I picked ones that were all definitely gonna be the same thing. And then when we did the genetics after the fact, one of them was still a cryptic and is a completely different species and we had to throw that out of the data set. So they're really hard to tell apart. <laughs> Some of them are really similar looking. But yeah, we use DNA. We're using kind of two different approaches, one which is cheaper and not as much data, but you can put in loads of samples. So that's where I'm getting stuff from all across the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And I'm just sequencing them all at this one site. And then I'm cherry picking from that a subset to do a much deeper, more expensive type of sequencing, which gives us more resolution and more confidence that they are different things. Yeah. And you go and collect these samples yourself. Some of them, yeah. It's really nice. I get to do some nice field work. So I just went to the Maldives last November, which was lovely, uh, as you would expect. And loads of pavona there, tons of pavona, about 10 to 15 different species. So that was really fantastic. We only have three here for comparison. I also get people to collect for me. So I've had collaborators send me stuff from Panama. People have sent me stuff from Papua New Guinea, uh, from the Red Sea. Because they're everywhere, I want samples from everywhere. <laughs> so I try and get as much as possible. But I've got to travel a lot. Been to Japan and the Marshall Islands a bunch of places. Watch more episodes and find additional content online at voiceofthesea.org. Follow us on social media at Voice of the Sea TV. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea.